Good morning and welcome back to our series, Now What?, where we're looking at the last several months. And the last several months were not exactly what we planned, but we have to ask the question, now what? What comes next for us? And honestly, when we look back at the last several months, I think for a lot of us, we look back and it's filled with loss. It's filled with the things we don't get to do, the vacations we don't get to take, the jobs we don't have anymore. And we're really kind of stuck in this place of wondering what comes next, but the truth is this season has also been a reset for us, a force that makes us slow down and say, what is most important in our lives? What do I actually prioritize? When everything is lost, what we experience are the things that are most important. Two weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus is ultimate. Jesus is at the center, like he is the only thing that will never be phased, will never change. We can rest in him because he's our rock. Last week, we talked about this shift in our relationships from these superficial friendships to something that stands, that has value and depth that we can go to even in the middle of a pandemic. Well, this week, we're gonna pivot just a little bit and we're gonna talk about families. And I know that can be a little tricky for some of us. If you're like me, you're single and don't have kids and you go, what in the world are we doing talking about family? But the truth is, all of us come from a family. Most of us will have some sort of family and all of us have intimate relationships, roommates, coworkers, people that are close to us that live out family with us. And at the very least, we have one another as the family that gets to experience this. And so all of us have something to learn and it's going to be tempting today to nudge your spouse or to nudge your kids and make sure they're listening. But today is about our own hearts, what we can learn, what we can grow in because we can only control how we step into this now what kind of a season. Before we jump too far into it though, let's just pray and prepare our hearts. God, I just thank you. I thank you that you are a God that sees us and knows us and loves us and wanted to build systems around us to protect us. I thank you for families, even when broken or hurting, we still have a landing spot. God, today as we learn, as we grow, will you challenge us in how we see our family, how we see the people closest to us and reframe how we can exist in those relationships. God, will you just speak to us so clearly? In your name we pray, amen. Just a little bit ago, we asked the question, what is something you learned about your family in the last four months? And you guys had some great answers. Haley says, routine doesn't change unless you make a change. That's good. Jordan says that we all love school even though some families don't. That's impressive, Jordan. Not all families are with you on that one. Linda said, they are, uh, they are all night owls except for me. I'm so sorry, Linda. That must be miserable. Heather said, our kids can stay up way later than we can. We're ready for bed at 9.30 and they can keep going for hours. I'm assuming you have little ones. Just high school alone, they will be up all hours of the night, absolutely. While there were some rough lessons that we learned, we also learned some fun things about our family members. Maybe things that weren't just pet peeves, but things we actually enjoy. For me, what I learned about my family is that video games are not all bad. I used to watch my brothers on their video games for hours at a time, and, and I just kept thinking, what can you be doing for that long? Like, your brain must be melting. Well, at the beginning of all of this, my brothers called me up and said, hey, download this game on your PlayStation. And I said, I don't even know what that means. But I did, I downloaded this game and every couple days someone would send out a text saying, are we in for this? And we'd log on, sometimes it'd be two of us, sometimes all four of us would log on and we'd play this game, but the most important part of it was I had a headset and we could talk about life. I could hear about this new girlfriend and I could hear about the wife, I could hear about their friendships. In fact, two of my brothers were in elementary school when I moved out to college. And so for me, I got to know my two little brothers as adults. I got a gift out of video games. I built friendship out of video games. It wasn't just all mind-melting activities. Hopefully, all of us have learned something about our kids, about our spouse, about our roommates that has helped us hold on to those relationships. 
The cool thing about my family, this last weekend we were in the Springs, they all came out to visit, which was pretty fun. They're all in different parts of California. And we went down and, and we went on this hike that was supposed to be easy and it wasn't. And about halfway through, people are passing us because we're not that fast, it's a lot of elevation. And, and as they're passing, I know in their head, they know my family goes together. Like we fit, right? We, we sound alike, my three brothers are all, very, very tall. I didn't get those genetics from them, right? They, they, they laugh the same. In fact, it takes me a moment to realize which one of them is laughing. Me and my mom, despite our hair colors being different right now, could be sisters. And you just know from our mannerisms, from the way we engage with people, that we go together. We fit. And maybe your family doesn't look alike. Maybe people wouldn't just automatically know you go together. But I think in our current society, we strive to go together. Let's just do that Christmas card, you know, just stand there, stand respectfully, wear the shirt that I asked you to wear. And we try and create this illusion of going together, this family that looks the part, but really, they don't really fit. And we strive for that daily. But the truth is, when it comes to the community of God, we grow together, not just go together. We grow together, not just go together. The hope isn't that we're a perfect Christmas card. The hope isn't that our house looks right and our family makes a good name for us when they're at the grocery store. The hope is actually that we grow that next to one another, we get better at life together. But it means we have to lay down this perfect picture of family and accept that growing comes with some choices and some pain. Well, the good news is Paul is going to lead us in this conversation. We've been reading through this book called Colossians and, and Paul's talking to this church in Colossae. And at first he's giving them mind knowledge. How do you grow to know God? But then he says, as you grow to know God, it's going to impact how you live your life. And so he starts talking about relationships and then he moves to something called household codes which was a normal thing in Roman society, and honestly, it's a normal thing in our homes now. There are rules and guidelines for how we conduct ourselves. The problem is, in Roman society, these household codes were basically, he's in charge, the, the patriarch is in charge, and everyone else just does exactly what he says. And this household code was entirely about giving power to the patriarch of the family. How do we continuously ask everyone else to obey? And so as Paul steps in to write about household codes, he has to undo some of the culture behind it. And for Paul, he understands that we do this by building up, by powering down. Building up, encouraging, lifting one another up by powering down. I don't need to be in charge in all moments. And that's frustrating. Power is easy. The power grab is, is pretty straightforward, but letting the power go is a little more difficult. And so I'd love to hear from you guys. Here's our next question. Go ahead and answer in whatever chat you're watching in. What do you like to have total control over in your life? What do you like to have total control over? I'm not saying you do have total control over it, but what do you like to have total control over in your life? For me, I learned as my family was planning this vacation, I love to control schedules. I got us all on a Zoom call a week and a half before the trip because that's how you do family meetings now is via Zoom, so that was a new experience. And I brought up this Excel spreadsheet Yes, I did. And on there I marked out who's in charge of what food and what food is going to be consumed and what trails we're gonna hike that day and who's going to pick up which person from the airport at which time with all of the airline information right there ready to go. We didn't follow it at all. It was really an illusion of control for me, but I like to control because then I know how to plan, I know what to pack, but Paul's moving us from this place of control to building up by powering down. And he starts by talking about spouses. He, he starts this conversation, chapter three, verse 18. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, if you're anything like me, you heard the words wives submit and you went, ooh, don't like that so much. That doesn't feel so good. 
we get this picture of blind obedience that you just need to do what he says, honor what he says, the end, no questions. But the truth is the word submit is actually more than that. You see, the word obedience he'll use in a couple verses from now, so he's not afraid to use the word obedience, but whenever Paul talks about husbands and wives, he never uses the word obedience. He uses the word submit, which is this picture of, I'm going to let go of what I desire, what I want, to step into something that's good for the greater whole. How do I let go of what I want to step into the better? And that's hard. But what's interesting is Paul uses this word at other moments. It's not just here. He actually uses it to talk about all of us, all of us believers need to submit to one another, male and female. We need to come together because the only way we can accomplish the better is by all of us letting go of what we want, letting go of our power to pursue something bigger, to pursue what is better for more people. And so he says to wives, let go and step into something that's better for the whole. But he doesn't stop there. He, he then turns the conversation in verse 19, and he says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love. This picture of love, you know, sounds great, right? You got the flowers when you get in an argument, and you've got Friday night date nights where the kids get a sitter, and, and you take them to this nice restaurant. Maybe this picture of love is the, you know, sweet nothings that you whisper to each other. I don't know what it is for you, but maybe there's a picture of what love looks like, but the word used here is more than that. The word used here is sacrificial love, that you're willing to give up what you want to step into what is better for the greater good. That word is submit. It's to let go. In fact, Jesus uses this word to describe the kind of love as he gives up his whole life for the sake of all of us. That's not cutesy romantic. That's difficult. That's painful. That's submissive. What does it look like for husbands to release what they want to step into what is good for the greater whole? And then he says, and don't be harsh. And this picture of harsh is actually to create bitterness in people. And this picture of bitterness is when you squash someone down and refuse to let them have a voice. When people don't have a voice, what stirs within them is bitterness. And as we squash people, we don't allow them to be a part of. And Paul is saying, release them from that. We do this together. We both let go and hand in hand, we step into what God wants for us. But that's the trick. Paul isn't just saying, hey, let go of what you want and step into some unknown. He's saying, let go of what you want to step into what God wants has for you. You're not just letting go of your own dreams for the sake of letting go. You're letting go because when you do that, you make room for something even better. It reminds me of my parents. When I was really young, I think I was four when they began doing this process, it was very cute. And they felt like God was calling something in their life, that God was stirring in their hearts. And so together, they spent a solid week praying and praying and praying and reading God's word and reading and reading. And they invited some of their mentors into the conversation. And through prayers, they realized God was asking something crazy. God was inviting them to move to China with a three-year-old and a five-year-old to start an underground church. And while that's amazing, what really happened is during that week, they let go of what they wanted to make room for what God had for them. If they could not do the submit part, if they could not do the love part, they never would have been able to step into the better that God has for them. Both my parents together let go and hand in hand stepped into one of the greatest adventures God would give them in their lifetime. It's pretty, pretty bold. That's a marriage that, that, that requires more of you, but you also get to experience more through it. So are you ready to submit? I asked the question, what do you like to have total control over in your life? And Megan said, the organization of my room. That's a good one. 
Julie said, I love to have control over whoever does the, what chore and when. It hasn't worked for me yet. I'm so sorry, Julie. <laughs> Probably won't. Doug said, driving. That's fair. I would like to never drive again. So, Doug, we've got this set up. Kristen says, what don't I like to have control over? That is the question. Absolutely, and while some of these feel funny and, and kind of goofy and, and we know we're never gonna have control over it, what this season, the last four months has done is reminded us we never had control in the first place. We never had control in the first place, right? Four or five months ago, everything we thought we knew was ripped away from us and now everyone's living under one roof and our jobs don't look the same. Eating, even eating out doesn't look the same. And so everything we thought we had a grasp on left. Well, I wonder if we don't wait for a pandemic but if we choose in our marriages, in our most intimate relationships, to lay ourselves down and say, I want to make room for what God has for us, it won't take a pandemic next time. Instead, our marriages can have revival day after day after day. But it requires us to say, you know what? I never had control. I'll never have control. But I can trust the one who does and hand in hand step into what God has for you. Well, Paul then pivots from talking about husbands and wives and begins to talk about parenting relationships. But I want us to notice he started with talking about marital relationships before he moves to talking about kids. And that's important because the best thing you can do for your kids is spend time with your spouse. Get to know your spouse. Build that relationship up because it will pour into your kids. You will never be as effective as you want until your marriage comes first. Well, then he moves to talking about kids. And I know not all of us have kids, but all of us know someone with kids. All of us know people that could use our support as they do this crazy adventure called parenting. And so we get to be a part of this conversation with them. Well, in biblical era, it wasn't quite the same as now, right? We, we send our kids to school, we send our kids to sports, we send our kids to a club, and we hope they get what they need while they're out there. But back then, everything was done at home. Your child's schooling was done at home. An apprenticeship came through your home. Even church community, learning about God was something experienced in the home because parents understood in this moment that they were the number one person that was responsible for their kids. They were in charge of their kids because they knew their kids, no matter what age they were, were in a season of becoming. They weren't adults yet. In fact, even at 16, they're not adults yet. Science actually tells us that our brains are still developing into adult brains until we're 25. Your children are becoming, and, and in biblical times, they understood that meant I need to help them build a foundation so that they can go into the world and be effective members of society. And now we outsource, which isn't bad. It's not bad to go to school. It's not bad to join sports teams. It's not bad to have relationships outside of the church. In fact, I think a lot of that is good. But you're still the hero in your child's story. Whether you recognize it or not, you may think, okay, no, 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 my kid's 16. I no longer have control over them. Their friends are their heroes. But here's the deal. I have your child in student programming at most two hours a week. You have more than two hours a day. Your kid's coach has them for a four-month season. You have them for 18 years. You are the hero in your child's story. I can look back at my life, and I know that the people that had the greatest impact on my faith, on my education, on my development, were my parents. So parents, you still have a job to do. And it's good. To get us there, though, I want to pause just a moment and ask us a question. Remember what it is like to be the kid. And so wherever you're watching, go ahead and just drop some answers in. The question is, what is one thing you wish you could tell your 10-year-old self? What is one thing you wish you could tell your 10-year-old self? One of the things I would tell myself is that orange vinyl skirt is not cute. Throw it away. There are some of you that maybe needed to hear early on, um, not all blues match. 
Some of you needed to hear, eat broccoli now because they make you eat it when you're older. But then there's also the serious messages we needed to hear. For me, I needed to hear that dark days don't define you. Dark days don't define you. I needed to hear that because I was going to walk through some of the most difficult years of my life. And I needed someone to tell me that those aren't going to be the end of me. Those aren't going to be the defining moments of my life. There will be better, there will be joy, there will be hope. And even if you're walking through darkness doesn't mean you yourself are dark. What is the message you needed to hear to prepare you for what came next? Well, Paul starts by actually talking to kids, which in and of itself implies that kids were learning alongside of adults, and it was okay that they were. In fact, I look around the room right now, and there are several kids in here. It is beautiful. It is a beautiful side effect of this season that your kids get to sit next to you and learn with you. He starts, and he says, verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. So kids, I would love to tell you that that doesn't mean what you think it means. But it does. Children, obey. It's not children obey when you feel like it. It's not children obey when it's convenient. Or it's not children obey until you feel like you know better than your parent. It's children obey. Do the dishes. Brush your teeth. Go to bed on time. Make sure your homework is done before the TV turns on. Take the garbage out the first time, not the eighth time. Obey, period. And really, he's not just saying this to be mean to children. There are two things happening. One, kids are learning what it's like to be an adult. They're in a season of becoming. And so when we're told to make our bed, it's helping us function better as adults. It's teaching us lessons so that we can be more effective as we grow. But it's also teaching us that the more we can obey our parents, the more we can honor them in what they say, the easier it will be to obey and honor God as he asks bigger and bolder things of us. We are practicing obedience so that we can continue to be obedient to God as he begins to take over our lives. Obedience is not just this ugly word of things we don't want to do. It's a life skill. It's good for you. There is a very small caveat. I had a student years ago uh, whose dad got drunk every night, and in the morning, his cure for his hangover was more alcohol. And so he looked at his 13-year-old daughter and handed her a $20 bill and said, I need you to go buy me more alcohol. And at some point, as she began to know God and experience more of God, she realized, God doesn't want this for me. This is not how God designs or desires me. And so at some point, she had to look at her dad and and honor him and say, Dad, I love you and I care about you, but I answer to God before I answer to you, so I can't do this. But I want you to hear me very clearly. That is maybe 1% of the cases. God's okay with you making your bed. God's okay with you doing your homework. God's okay with you putting your cleats outside because they smell. God is okay with all of these things. And so for the most part, what we need to do is children obey, period. Well, he doesn't stop there. He turns to the parents. In verse 21, he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. He turns to the parents and he says, do not provoke. And this idea is that you're stirring the pot, that you're, you're in my house, we call it poking the bear. You're creating more hostility than needs to be. You're making things more anxious at home. In fact, most of the time I think our provoking is actually creating defense in our kids. And I don't think we do it on purpose. I don't think we're intentionally creating these systems for our kids to be provoked, to be stirred. But I think sometimes what comes out of our mouth does it naturally. Like maybe when we say, because I said so. It's, it's not actually helping your child develop as an adult. And it is true, you do have the right, right? They do have to obey. And it is, it is an honest statement. But because I said so creates defense in your kids when we actually have the option to say, hey, I want you to clean your room because when your room is clean, you function better. You do better in society and I want to help you succeed. 
When we give kids the why, we take away defense and we give them tools to succeed. But maybe that's not your phrase. Maybe it's, you know, your sister never did it this way. Or I never would have gotten away with this as a kid. Or maybe it's not even the words you say, but the sarcasm that comes out of your mouth that you may think is funny, but your kid doesn't actually grasp it yet. How do we remove the defense and encourage growth? In fact, the second half of this is he says, we don't want to dishearten or discourage. We actually want to encourage our kids, give them what they need to succeed. We encourage them. When kids hear constantly, because I said so, because I said so, because I said so, they give up and they be, become disheartened. Instead, we have the opportunity to teach them the why. And the why for your kid will go a long way. Well, the cool thing about both children obeying and, and parents not provoking is both are growing together. The good news is you get your child little and you get to walk through the stage and, and as your child is growing, you in your parenting are also growing. It was built that way, it was designed that way on purpose. And here at Eastern Hills, we have some things that help kind of grab hold of each stage so that you can continue to grow with them. So if you have an early childhood kiddo, someone under the age of five, not quite in schooling, we believe you are your child's caregiver. You are your child's caregiver. And a caregiver not only takes care of diapers and feeds the kid and helps them learn to walk, but they do so with presence. They're there saying, I got you, this is great, because you are the first picture of Jesus to your child. They are not just being changed, they are experiencing life with you, and you get to help them experience Jesus' love. When they fall down, you pick them back up and you're present with them. When they wanna show you 800 things on the iPad, you're present with them. And then as your child moves from early childhood into elementary, your parenting grows just like your kid does, and you become the captain. You become the captain in your child's world. And captains are great. They're on the field, and they're watching the plays happen all around them. They're calling things. They're inviting you over. They're talking through things. All right, let's go. And for you, that means when your kid comes home and sits down, you unpack all the homework, and you go, what do you need to do first? Let's talk through it because they don't have that life skill. You are helping them develop those life skills. Maybe you're still going on play dates with them. Maybe you're still going to birthday parties and you're going, hey, that kid over there looks like you could use a friend. Why don't you go talk to him? You're the captain, you're on the field. But then your kid moves into their preteen years, fourth or fifth grade, and you go from being the captain on the field to the coach on the sideline. And this one's hard. You're no longer in their day-to-day -day activities. Instead, you're on the side, and, and when they come home, you go, okay, let's talk about it, let's talk about it, all right, go back out. Or when you notice your child is overwhelmed and exhausted, you call them off the field and you give them a break, which means when they call you at lunchtime, and they say, hey, I forgot my project, can you bring it to me? You go, I'm not on the field. I can't bring it to you right now. And so you, you wait for them to come home and you go, okay, how did we forget it? What was it that we should have done differently? How do we set ourselves up for success? And then give them another chance the next day. You're still doing life with them, but you're doing it from the sidelines. And then we get to some bigger jumps. As your child moves from their preteen years to middle school years, they go through a lot of change. And so do you. You become your child's counselor. And this one is hard. You don't get to give advice, you sit back and you listen to them. You hear what they're saying and say it back to them in a new way so that they can experience it with fresh eyes. They need to begin to solve their own problems. They need to begin to find their own solutions. And so you're there listening and you're there, you're asking great questions. And one of the best things you can do for a middle schooler is they went from understanding happy and sad to now having 400,000 new emotions. They are experiencing heartbreak. They are experiencing betrayal. They are getting information at school that is not something you taught at home. They now have to learn how to deal with all those things. Give them the words and the confidence to face those things because the first heartbreak is hard, even if it doesn't seem like it to you. And then as your child moves from middle school to high school, you become the consultant. This one's hard. 
This one's hard because you don't get to control. Just like when you were husband and wife and you had to let go of what you wanted to step into what Jesus wanted for you, you now have to let go of what you want for your kids so that your kid can step into what Jesus wants. And as they come to you, they go, that's what Jesus wants for me. And you go, okay, how are you gonna get there? Consultants help make the steps that get you to the goal that Jesus set for them. And the best thing a consultant can do is when the client falls, when the client fails and missteps, you pick them back up and you say, that doesn't disqualify you from the goal God gave you. Your high school student is going to make mistakes, but what they need to know is most mistakes we make in high school don't destroy the rest of our lives. God still has something for us to do. And you may have noticed over time In each of these parenting seasons, God's slowly been moving you one step away, loosening your grip on your child, and that's doing two things. One, it's setting your child up to succeed without you because they need to listen to God. Their obedience is moving from you to Jesus, but also it's setting you up to let them go and live out the relationship you have at home. And it's hard, it's hard to let go but it is also so beautiful. Now kids, before you think you're off the hook, all of you have a role too. If you're in middle school, you have to talk to your counselor. You have to let them know what's really going on. You have to be honest and open about all the new emotions and thoughts and feelings that you're experiencing. If you're in high school and and your parent is a consultant, you have to talk to them about what God's calling you to. You have to be open about your mistakes so that you guys together can get back on track. You have to communicate. And both parents and kids are growing together, not just going together. And it's tough, but it is good. I asked the question, what is one thing you wish you could tell your 10-year-old self? And Hemming said, listen to your dad when he says that temper is going to get you in trouble. Jen said, never settle. Don't let fear control your decisions. Oof, that's good. Ryan said, I tell myself to eat healthier and don't try to grow up too fast. And Scott said, no matter how bad things may seem, always strive to find the positives in everything. I don't know what message you needed to hear, but what I've learned is that every person has their own unique message because they are their own unique person that they need to hear. Each of your children has something that they need on their heart and you are the hero in their story. You get to be present with them and give them that message. You get to be the parent that says, dark days don't define you, Kelsey, you've got this because you are with them, you're growing alongside of them. You get to equip this generation to change the world and it happens at home. When all of us, husband, wife, kids, roommates, coworkers, let go of what we want to step into what Jesus has for us. You guys can have an impact on your family more than you know but it starts with some self-reflection. Here's my question for you. What do you need to be present in your household? What do you need to change to be present right now with your kids, with your family, with your spouse, with your roommates? What do you need to change? Maybe you need to close the laptop once work hours are done. Maybe you need to save Friday nights for family game nights. Maybe you need to deal with something that happened in your past so that you can be present with your kids now. What is it that your family needs? Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for the families in this room, for the families watching online. I thank you so much for the impact they are able to have on one another as they let go of what they want and step into what you want for us. God, please light our homes on fire with you. Give us the rest we need, the rejuvenation we need to wake up every morning and be present with one another, to grow with one another. Give us the patience to hear each other out even when we don't understand. God, Help us every single day wake up and remember it's a new day for our marriage. It's a new day 
for our family. It's a new day for our home. And help us rest in knowing that you love us so much. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Help make us better. In your name we pray. Amen.